Did you hear me? His mum asked. What? Mott curled up tighter as a new spasm clutched at his belly. I said that if you don't feel better when you wake up, be sure to call Ron. I'm going to go get on the phone with him before I leave and tell him you may be needing him. Ron was Dr. T. That was actually a good idea. Mott said so and then he closed his mouth on the groan that wanted to erupt into the room. In the hallway, Rory shouted, I'm starving! His mum leaned over and kissed Mott on the forehead. Sleep, honey. You'll feel better soon. She closed... She crossed to the door, gave him one last look, and left the room. He heard her talking softly to Rory in the hallway. Then he heard Rory's footsteps pounding down the stairs and his mum's tapping heels after that. Mott closed his eyes and tried to sleep. Tried, being the op operative word. When Mott looked at his bedside digital clock for the 761st time, okay, maybe he hadn't quite looked quite that many times, but close, at 1.37 in the afternoon, precisely he gave up trying to convince himself he was going to feel better soon. It just wasn't going to happen. At 1.38, he got up and went to the bathroom. He thought maybe if he could use the toilet, he'd feel better. Five minutes later, he was back in his bedroom and he wasn't feeling better. Moaning, he changed into sweats, a t-shirt and some athletic shoes. He called Dr. T's clinic. Claudia, Dr. T's receptionist, answered. Mott could picture her holding the phone as they spoke. Large and cushy with wildly curly hair and kind hazel eyes, Claudia was a caring woman Mott had known as long as he'd known Dr. T. She immediately put Dr. T on the phone. Can you get over here on your own? Dr. T asked. I think I can bike over. Uh, Mott struggled to get out. His hesitations weren't entirely caused by stomach cramps. The whispers were getting louder, and they were as distracting as all get out. What he was hearing sounded kind of like someone quickly scanning through radio, st radio stations. However, he was hearing snatches of words and phrases instead of snatches of songs. None of them were anything he wanted to listen to. In about 15 minutes, Dr. T said. I'm sorry, what? I said your voice and your hesitations aren't giving me a lot of confidence in your biking abilities. Claudia's going on a lunch break and she said she'll, she'll swing over to get you. She'll be there in about 15 minutes. Oh, I don't want to. Don't argue with your doctor, Dr. T said. He chuckled. Mott sighed. Thank you. One of the voices whispered, Sucker. Dr. T had exam rooms des designed to please the various age groups he focused on. He had some for the little kids, the grade school kids, and the teens. Unfortunately, because Dr. T was squeezing in Mott between other patients, Mott landed in a little kid room. So, when he lay on his back, he was staring up at a ceiling painted with sparkly rainbows, flying purple pigs, and a blue-tinged pegasus that at the moment resembled a sea bunny far as it should have. It must have been the wings, which look vaguely like bunny ears. And that purplish blue colour. He never really wanted to see that colour again. Mott quickly looked away from the ceiling, turning his head to gaze at the room's walls. They were painted yellow and covered with animal stencils. Pretty much every imaginable animal had a spot in the room, including a rabbit, which Mott could have sworn was staring at him with animosity. Mott closed his eyes. The paper beneath him crinkled as he shifted to find a semi-comfortable position while Dr. T prodded his belly. Every time Dr. T asked, Does this hurt? Mott gasped, Yes. Dr. T stepped back and sat on his rolling stool. Mott heard the vinyl squeak and the rollers rattle as Dr. T scooted over to the laptop he'd set up at a small counter next to the exam table. Dr. T was kind of a funny looking guy. This was mostly caused by his big ears and his equally large nose, but a goatee that came to the point under his chin contributed too. On top... Uh, wait, sorry. There's this weird formatting... Uh, on top of these eye-catching features, he was short and totally bald. When Mott and Nate were ten, Dr. T had shaved what little remained of his light brown hair. He looked a bit like one of the seven dwarfs, or maybe a gnome. He might have been nice, one of the nicest people Mott had ever met, though, even nicer than Mott's mum. His mum occasionally lost a temper. Dr. T never did. Mott tried to concentrate on how nice Dr. T was, but the whispered voices got louder. He was now hearing more full sentences. You don't know what you're dealing with, for example, came through clearly. Mott tried to keep his breathing steady while he watched Dr. T type. I just realised, Mott isn't a murderer. 
he he just threw the I'm such an idiot. He just threw the sea bonnies down the toilet. He flushed the sea bonnies and they're calling him a murderer for it. Ah. Oh, I would have absolutely loved this story if it was revealed that he was a murderer. Damn it. Mott tried to keep his breathing steady while he watched Dr. T type. He felt sweat trickle down between his shoulder blades and he squirmed. He was attempting to stay calm, but these cramps and the relentless whispers were terrifying. What was happening inside his body? Mott abruptly rose up on an elbow. He glanced at his belly and he frowned. Did his belly look lumpy? He thought it did. Okay, Dr. T said. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get Louise in here to draw some blood. The blood test will tell me if you have an infection. When she's done with that, Louise will also do an ultrasound. That will tell me if we're looking at a gallbladder issue, which is a possibility. Mott nodded. He didn't bother any... He, he didn't bother to ask questions about his gallbladder. He pointed at his belly. Do you think my stomach looks lumpy? I think it looks lumpy. Dr. T stood and looked down at Mott's stomach. It looks normal to me, and I didn't feel any masses. Mott frowned. Okay. Dr. T patted Mott's thigh. When you feel like crap, it's easy for the mind to start imagining all kinds of worst case scenarios. So, let's start with the treatment right away. Even while we get the test set up. What treatment? Dr. T flipped his computer screen, turning it into a tablet. He tapped the screen and handed it to Mott. Watch this. Louise will be here in a few minutes to draw blood and do the ultrasound. Dr. T pressed a button and the upper part of the table Mott lay on raised a little. That work? Mott nodded. He took the tablet. Dr. T patted his leg again. I'll be back after I look, after your, look at your tests. In the meantime, he pointed at the tablet screen Mott held. Watch that. Dr. T strode from the room, closing the door behind him. Mott, cringing at another round of cramping, looked at the screen. It was frozen on a video of a stand-up comic routine. He managed a half-smile and shook his head. Leave it to Dr. T to prescribe laughter. Maybe the laughter helped. Mott had been tempted to set aside Dr. T's tablet and just be miserable while he waited for Louise. But two more intense cramps and a whispered, your time is coming, got him to hit play on the screen. He hadn't heard of the comedian in the video, but he was really funny. Mott managed to chuckle at first, and then he was actually laughing so hard that Louise, a small dark-haired woman in a ponytail, had to pause the video while she took blood. She let him watch again while she did the ultrasound, which she did silently. After a few minutes of feeling her pressing the magic wand, as she called it, over his stomach, Mott asked, Do you see anything? I don't, kiddo, she said. But we'll have Dr. T come in and give a look-see to be sure. The look-see came quickly. Dr. T studied the scan and grinned at Mott. Everything looks normal. Really? Mott frowned. Then why do I feel so bad? Honestly, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, my guess is that you have food poisoning. I'll know more when I get your blood work, but nothing horrible is going on. Mott nodded. Okay. Dr. T squeezed his shoulder. Your enthusiasm is overwhelming, he chuckled. How about this? Why don't you go get dressed and you hang out on the sofa in my office? I have a couple more patients to see. Then I'm heading home. I'll give you a ride. Mott nodded again. When Dr. T and Louise left the room, Mott sat up on the edge of the exam table and took in what Dr. T had said. He tried believing it. You're fine, he told himself out loud. Liar, liar, pants on fire, the whispers countered. Oh, wow, this is really good. Mott shook his head and stood up to get dressed. You're not real, he said to the whispers. I'm fine. Although he could have sworn that he heard sibilant laughter in his head, Mott ignored it and got dressed. Strangely, the cramping had abated a little. Maybe it was the laughter, but it was more likely the power of suggestion. He was comforted by the, the results of the ultrasound. If something foreign had been in his belly, the scan would have found it. Right? Right. Mott was able to walk Sammy normally down the clinic's hallway, behind the purple and white striped door of exam room 2, near Dr. T's office, a little girl giggled. Mott smiled. It was a nice sound, much nicer than the poisonous murmurs in his head. He pushed open the door of Dr. T's office and dropped onto Dr. T's overstuffed blue and yellow polka dot couch. Listening to the continued giggling, he fell asleep. He woke only long enough to uh, only long enough for Dr. T to walk him out to Dr. T's new SUV and get him home. 
Then he went up to his bed, and he fell back asleep. When Mott woke up, it was dark, but the dark wasn't nighttime dark, it was pre-dawn dark. He sat up. He'd slept for over 12 hours. Taking shock, he realised he felt okay. His stomach was sore, but he wasn't cramping like before. The whispers were still in his head, but they seemed muted. Fumbling for his small bedside lamp, Mott switched it on. As soon as the light poured onto his nightstand, he saw a bottle of water, several crackers in a plastic bag, and a note. He picked up the note. Mott, you were sleeping soundly, and Ron said that the best that was the best thing for you, so I didn't wake you. I've left you some crackers in case you want to wake, unless you wake a cup hungry. If you need me, come and get me. I love you, Mom. Mott smiled and reached for the bottled water. He was really thirsty, so he quickly unscrewed the lid. He started to bring the bottle to his lips, but then he stopped. He held the bottle under the glow of his lamp, and he studied it. He rolled his eyes. It was just water, bottled water in a sealed container. It was fine. He drank some water, and he reached for the crackers. Leaning back on his pillows, he opened the plastic bag and plucked out a whole wheat cracker. Munching on it, he looked around his semi-dark room, at the nature posters and photos of his favourite baseball stadiums, at the shelves full of video games and math puzzle books, at the closet he knew was stuffed with his clothes and hiking and fishing gear. He took comfort in being reminded of who he was. He wasn't Mott, a boy infested by sea bonnies. He was Mott, lover of baseball and video games and math and camping out, best friend to Nate and Lyle, a good brother to Rory and maybe soon-to-be boyfriend to Teresa. He was a normal teen. You're a freak, the whispers countered. Yeah, and you're not real, he told them. In the light of this new day, it felt even more true. He shook his head. Sea bonnies couldn't even hatch without purified water above 75 degrees. How are they going to survive his stomach acid? He chuckled as he kept munching on crackers and looking around his room. Over Mott's desk, uh, opposite his bed, he had a dark green bulletin board covered in photos. The photos represented his favourite things and best memories. The one in the middle was a picture of him and his dad sitting in a rowboat in the middle of the lake where his family had a summer cabin. His dad always got a couple weeks off in July and they went to the cabin to swim and hike and fish. Mott usually felt disconnected from his dad but when they fished he felt close to... F fish. <laughs> Mott dropped his half-eaten cracker and sat up. His reminiscing had reminded him of Fritz, the fish that was no longer a fish, when F Mott flushed it down the toilet with the sea bonnies. He hadn't imagined the way not Fritz had looked when Mott had last seen him. He might have been imagining the whispers, but he'd seen what he'd seen. Fritz had been eaten from the inside out and replaced by sea bonnies. He was pretty sure fish had stomach acid too, and yet the sea bonnies had still managed to get him. Oh, she. <laughs> uh, Mott looked down at his belly. Setting aside the plate, he raised his shirt with a trembling hand. He put his palm against the skin. It was normal, wasn't it? Mott thought about how horrible he'd felt before and after, and how he felt now. He'd assumed the end of the cramps were a good thing. But what if all that meant... That, what if all that meant was that the sea bonnies had finished their work on his stomach? Maybe he felt better because his belly was no longer being consumed. It was now something else. His not belly. <laughs> Mott gingerly felt all over his stomach. Did it feel different than it used to? More gelatinous? Or gelatinous? That's a very nice word, I like that. Mott groaned and swiped the bag of crackers off his lap. They hit the floor with a muffled crunch, and Mott slid all the way under his covers, pulling them up over his head. He wanted to escape, to hide from the world. No, what he wanted was to hide from the sea bonnies and from himself. You can't hide, the whispers told him. Yeah, Mott said. Watch me. Mott covered his ears and started humming. That's where his mum found him, under his covers, humming like a little kid, when she came into his room still in her robe, to check on him. Mott? He threw back the covers and looked at her. Apparently he looked worse than he felt. As soon as her gaze landed on her face, on his face, she frowned and said, You're staying home again today. He didn't argue with her. After his mum and Rory left the house, 
Mott dropped back into sleep, but he didn't stay asleep for long. This was unfortunate, because as soon as he was awake, his mind was inundated by the whispers again. The whispers in Mott's head, however, were no longer whispers. They were full-on shouts. If he didn't drown them out, he was going to lose his mind. Mott threw back his covers and dashed to his desk to get his earbuds. Putting them in, he started filling his ears with driving rock music. He could still hear the shouts. What could he do? He looked around, his gaze landing on his, sh on his shelves. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I thought I was in the wrong place. Uh, his gaze landing on his shelves, he reached out and picked up one of his handheld video games. He got back under the covers and he turned on the game. Mott spent the better part of the day trying to drown out the shouts, but not even deafening rock music and fast-moving video games could beat them down. Then, some, sometime during that afternoon, maybe a little after 2pm, Mott started feeling old. When he stopped his game to figure out why he felt that way, he realised he had a strange vibration in his chest and belly. It was like the very faintest suggestion of movement, as if something was shaking his organs from the inside. He felt like his heart... Wait. He felt like his heart... Okay, there's, there's no end to that sentence. That's weird. He felt like his heart... something. Well, I apologise for that. There, there's weird formatting there. And it just cut off the sentence. So hopefully we haven't missed anything. Uh, but it continues with... Mott picked up the phone and called Dr. T's cell phone. He didn't want to go through to Claudia. Hello? This is Dr. Tabor. Uh, Mott gripped the phone. Dr. T, this is Mott. Hey, Mott, how are you feeling this morning? Um, that's the thing, I still feel weird. Still cramping? Not so much cramping as, um, like, shaking on the inside. Like, my organs are, um, trembling. For four seconds, Mott counted. The only thing he heard through the phone was the faintest of hisses in the line. Then Dr. T said, let's do this. I'm on your way over to the hospital uh, uh, to visit a couple of patients before I head home for a while. I need to go back in late tonight to work on inventory with Claudia. So I'm leaving the clinic early. Why don't I stop by and get you? We'll see if we can squeeze you in for a CAT scan. <laughs> CAT scan. Shouldn't be a problem. Given what you're telling me, I can get insur insurance approval for it. Do you want me to talk to your mum before I come over? I'll do it. Mott said quickly. He didn't want to worry his mother. Dr. T was quiet for another few seconds. Okay, I'll talk to her later, after the scan. That'd be good. As soon as he hung up the phone, Mott scribbled a note for his mum on the back of the note she'd left for him, just in case she got home before he did. The note was, the note was filled with lies, but the truth was out of the question. What was he supposed to write? Mum, I've gone to get a scan to see if sea bodies are eating me from the inside out. No, that wouldn't be a good idea. He settled with an evasive lie. Mum, I'm feeling better. Gone out to get some fresh air. We'll call later. Love you, Mott. Mott sat in front of Dr. T's small oak desk in his clinic's office. Dr. T was on the phone talking to another doctor, one who had analysed the CAT scan. Mott wasn't listening to what Dr. T was saying. He really didn't care at this point. He'd heard enough from Dr. T himself. Now, he was just trying to stay calm, so he was leaning forward his elbows on his knees, and he was staring at his shoes. There was a brown speck on one of his white athletic shoes. He was using it as a focal point, concentrating on, on it the way a seasoned meditator might stare at a candle. He wondered if he should try a mantra, or maybe an om. He needed something uh, to tether him to sanity because the facts were dragging him quickly toward madness. Apparently the scan had reveals had revealed abnormalities in Mott's stomach, intestines, lungs, and heart. They look variegated in a way that was inconsistent with normal tissue. Dr. T and the other doctor were now discussing potential causes of the abnormalities. Were they tumours? Were they evidence of some sort of systematic infection? No and no. The doctors knew of no biological cause that could be responsible for the scan's results. Mott didn't care about the discussion because he already knew what had caused the variegated appearance of his organs. He'd seen it as soon as Dr. T had shown Mott his scan. Here's what the CAT scan revealed, Dr. T had said. 
tapping a few keys on his laptop to bring up the images of Mott's scam. Dr. T had pointed to light-coloured clumps clustered together all through Mott's intestines, his stomach, his lungs and his heart. The clumps were greyish white and they had small dark specks sprinkled throughout. At first glance, the specks appeared to be random, but when Mott had been closer to Dr. T's computer screen, it was obvious the specks weren't hap haphazard. No, the specks came in pairs, and they weren't specks, they were eyes. <gasps> if you really studied the clumps, you could see that they were made up of elongated forms, each vaguely rabbit-shaped, each with two dark dots. Wow. Mott had almost thrown up when he'd seen the truth of what was going on inside him, but for some reason he hadn't been able to. He gagged, but nothing had come up. Dr. T hung up the phone, steepled his fingers, and looked at Mott across his desk. Dr. Jenkins and I agreed that the scan's abnormalities or anomalies don't fit anything seen before. That's a good thing. It means that the scan's results are likely caused by an issue with the scan itself, interference with the machine. He suggested we repeat the scan tomorrow morning, and I think that's a good idea. Mott tore his gaze away from the brown spot on his shoe. He looked at Dr. T. Ignoring the rippling sensation that he felt in his chest, he said, We don't need to repeat the scan. I know what it is. He was shocked by how calm he sounded. His words were totally flat. Too flat, actually. He sounded a little like a robot, but that was just because he was too stunned to bother with putting infection. Inflection in his words, sorry. Dr. T frowned at Mott. What do you think it is, Mott? Is there something you haven't told me? Mott's figure, Dr. T, thought Mott had taken something he shouldn't have taken. In a way, he had, but not on purpose. Uh, Mott shook his head. No. I mean, yes, but it's not what you think. Dr. T raised his eyebrows and waited. The thing is, Mott said, scooting forward in his seat. A few days ago, Rory got some sea bonnies from Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. I really like how a lot of the time in the Fazbear Fright stories, we've seen people who have, who should have gone to the doctor but didn't and then suffered the consequences. For example, Stanley in Room for One More. And there's a lot more examples of that uh, throughout the Fazbear Fright series. And, but now we're getting one where someone is actually telling the doctor the insane story that they're going through. And I really want to know if it ends well or if it if it ends badly still. Uh, that, this is very intriguing. Um, a few days ago, Rory got some sea bonnies from Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Dr. T frowned a question. They're kind of like sea mon monkeys, Milt said. You know, those brine shrimp things. Dr. T nodded. A couple of days after they hatched, Mott continued, I noticed that Fritz, Rory's goldfish, which shared the tank with the sea bonnies, didn't look right. When I really looked at him closely, he was no longer a goldfish. It was like all the sea bonnies had eaten him from the inside out, infested him. Mott could tell from Dr. T's blank expression that Mott was losing him. When Dr. T opened his mouth to speak, Mott started talking faster, almost running his words together the same way Rory did when he got excited. That's what made me realise I had to get rid of the things, which I did. I flushed them, and Rory was all upset. But later that night, I got a drink of water, and I felt something go down my throat, and I tried to convince myself it wasn't a sea bonnie, but now I think it is. And I think it started eating my tissue, and it multiplied, and now my insides are turning into sea bonnies, the same way Fritz turned into sea bonnies. They're eating me from the inside, and they're coming together to replace my organs. I think that's why I feel so weird on the inside, like I'm jiggling from within. Like gelatin, sort of, but not exactly. Mott stopped talking. He concentrated on breathing in and out, which for obvious reasons was becoming harder than usual. He tried not to think about masses of sea, sea bodies roiling around together to form the walls of his lungs. Dr. T took a deep breath. It's time to call your mom. Mott slumped in his chair. Ah! Uh, and now it's just going to be like... Hey, you need to go, you need to go to uh, a, a psychologist. Oh no. Oh no. This story is crazy. I really want to know what the ending is. I hope it's good. Several hours later, near midnight, uh, Mott sat on the edge of his bed. Once again, he was staring at the brown spot on his shoe. He'd been staring at his shoe for a long time, an abnormally long time. He was staring at it mostly because he didn't know what else to do. 
He stared at it through the better part of the evening, listening to Rory chatter at his mum, listening to his mum trying to get Rory to calm down and go to bed, listening to Rory finally settle into his room, listening to his mum's footsteps pause outside Mott's door and then continue on to her room. Obviously, she decided to deal with him in the morning. Outside, thunder rumbled. Finally, the weather suited the situation. I was about to say, that's pathetic fallacy right there. Uh, when they left the clinic earlier in the evening, Mott had noticed the ozone! Ah! Mott had noticed the ozone smell in the air, and he turned his face up to the soft rain starting to fall. For an instant, it had soothed him. But just for an instant, a streak of jagged lightning on the horizon had brought him back to his intolerable reality. Nothing he was facing could be eased by a little bit of rain. Now the rain matched how Mott felt. It wasn't soft or soothing. It was, in uh, it was angry and insistent. He could hear it thrumming on the roof, assaulting the house like thousands of jackhammers trying to drill through the shingles. When Mott's mom had brought him home and asked him to go up to his room, she'd followed him as far as his doorway. Then she'd said in this strained voice she used when she was trying to remain calm but wanted to scream hysterically, Please stay here. We'll talk later. For hours, Mott had been thinking about what that talk would be like. How would he convince her he wasn't crazy? Did he even want to try? Wouldn't it be better if he was crazy? When you weighed the pros and cons, crazy was definitely the preferred scenario. If he was crazy, the worst that could happen was that he might get into a mental hospital for a while. Maybe he'd have to do some group therapy, talk about feelings, and eat yucky tapioca pudding. Tapioca pudding, sorry. Uh, but he'd be Mott. He'd be Mott, made up of his own parts. A human. Normal. The alternative to crazy was being not Mott. Absolutely unable to forget what not Fritz had looked like. Mott had knew that when the sea bonnies were done with him, if they were consuming him from the inside, Mott wouldn't be anything remotely resembling a human, and that meant Mott's life would be over. He wanted to convince himself he was going crazy, he really did, but the problem with that was the CAT scan. He wasn't the only person who had seen something weird on the scan. Dr. T had seen it, and so had the other doctor. They hadn't seen sea bonnies, of course, because their minds didn't let them entertain something so absurd something so outside the bounds of what science understood to be possible. But they had seen something. Mott wasn't imagining the physical changes in his body. This was a very worrying fact. Mott felt an inch on his forearm. Then, then, he idly scratched it. It still itched. He scratched harder. When the spot kept itching, he looked down at his arm. And there, where it itched, something moved just under his skin. Ah! Oh! Ah, oh, that's horrifying. Mott stood up so fast he got dizzy and immediately collapsed back onto the bed. He swallowed hard and stared at his arm. Yes, there, the faintest of elongated lumps were slithering under his, the surface of his skin. Mott groaned. His whole forearm started to itch, and he scratched at it so hard that he broke the skin. In horror, he stared at the blood wailing up. Flicking up through, the, through that blood, the tail of a sea bonny squirmed in the thick redness, his eyes nearly bugging out of his head. Mott watched the sea bonnie tail disappear as the sea bonnie dove back down under his skin. If he could have sawed his arm off and thrown it away, he would have. His whole arm itched now, and he could see that the movement was all up and down his arm. Not only that, his skin was changing colour. Right in front of his eyes, his skin was losing its normal pigment. It was becoming translucent, and his skin was turning a shade of purple blue. Mott looked over at his other arm. The same thing was happening to it. For several seconds, Mott didn't move, not at all. He wasn't even sure he was breathing. He became a statue, a frozen collection of mutating cells overseen by a brain incapable of accepting the impossible transformation. Because this had to be impossible. He could not be sitting here watching sea bonnies eat his skin from the underneath. He was not seeing them take bite after bite of his cells, ingesting and integrating what used to be part of him and turning it into more of them. He was not being devoured and replaced by sea bonnies. This was not real. Maybe there was something wrong with his eyes. Maybe he was hallucinating. Suddenly able to move, as if released from some paralytic drug or an evil magic spell, Mott jumped to his feet and ran to his dresser. Leaning over the top of it, pushing aside his deodorant and his hairbrush, he peered into his own eyes in the mirror. 
and he saw a sea bonnie swim through the white surrounding his left iris. Then he saw two wind, uh, two wind around the darker flecks of the brown in his right iris. No. <laughs> Mott lost what was left of his grip on reality. He ran for his door, intending to flee the house, but he stopped when he heard his mother's voice in the hallway. He couldn't face her like this. What if he infected her? He needed to get back to Dr. T. Now that it was obvious that it was happening to Mott, maybe Dr. T could help him. Dr. T had said he was going back to his clinic to work that night. Mott had, ne had to get to the clinic. Mott whirled and raced to his window. Throwing it open, he popped the screen and climbed out into the night, onto the roof of the deck. Immediately, the rain stung his skin and his eyes. He didn't care. He crawled quickly to the edge of the porch roof, and he bent over to grab the top of a downspout. Not concerned about cutting his hands, Mott wrapped them around the metal and swung his legs over the edge of the roof. Grasping the gutter sprout with his, with his arms and legs, he slid down like a fireman's pole, and he hit the ground hard. His ankle turned, and, his, and pain shot up his leg, but he ignored it. He also ignored the pain throbbing in his hands. Mott looked out into the darkness extending behind his house. Why hadn't he brought a flashlight? Well, maybe because he was a little distracted by being eaten by sea bonnies. That was a reasonable excuse. Between the night and the rain coming down in almost solid walls of water, it was nearly impossible to see. That was okay. He knew his yard, and he knew the forest behind it. He would find his way. He would have gone out to the sidewalk where streetlights would show him the way, but he didn't want to be by the street. There were too many cars with bright headlight beams he didn't want to be caught in. So Mott sloshed through the grass in his yard and he scaled the fence at the back. He figured he could follow the green belt through his neighbourhood. He knew if he stuck to the relatively narrow band of trees, they'd eventually lead him back to Dr. T's clinic. It was just a mile or so away. He could walk it. Mott was so drenched by the time he reached the trees that his clothes clung to him like they were a part of him. Or maybe they were part of the sea bonnies now. Light from the houses along the green belt uh, reached into the forest, enough so Mott could see that the ground was covered with standing water. Huge puddles had formed in the spongy loam under the old trees. The water was getting caught up in the depressions between vast root systems stretching uh, through the underbrush. Mott ran through the puddles and stumbled over no knobby roots, occasionally falling th against a rough tree trunk. As he ran, he scratched his arms which still itched incessantly, intensely. He couldn't stop digging at himself. Not long after Mott left his house, he didn't know how long, because time was beginning to be something that made no sense to him, Mott scratched so hard at his bicep, and when he punched his hand away, he saw in the yellow glow from someone's porch light that he'd torn out a huge chunk of his own flesh. No, not his own flesh. When Mott looked at what was held in his hand, he recoiled, staggering back into the branches of an old oak tree. Instead of embracing him, the twigs prodded and speared him, but that didn't matter. Nothing mattered but the fact that Mott was holding a handful of madly swimming sea bonnies instead of the flesh he thought he'd pulled away from his arm. Sickened, Mott flushed the swimming creatures to the ground. He started to hurry on, but he noticed the sea bonnies were swimming energetically, coming together in an organised school to, to follow the rivulets from one puddle to the next. He stopped and stared, then realised they were swimming after him. They were pursuing him. Mott took off. He started reeling through the trees, zigging this way and that, not just to avoid the trees, but to evade the sea bonnies coming after him. He wished he could hear them advancing so he knew where they were. He knew better than to stop and turn to see them. They'd catch up if he did. But he couldn't hear them. Mott could hear nothing but the staccato... I don't know why I said it like that. Staccato rhythm of the rain and his own rapid breathing. He managed about ten ungainly strides over the uneven ground before he tripped and went down on one, onto one knee. As soon as he did, the sea bonnies were there. He couldn't see them, but he could feel them. They immediately swam up his jeans and found their way to his arms, where they reattached, him, reattached themselves. Mott could feel his body reabsorbing the wriggling creatures. He also realised he could feel the sea bodies all through his body now. They were in every vein, every artery, every organ, every nerve, every system in his entire body. They were everywhere. Mott turned his face to the sky and he screamed. He screamed out his fear, his, his disbelief and his rage. He screamed at the insanity of it all. 
He screamed because what else could he do but scream? He didn't know how to fight this battle. He didn't understand it. He couldn't even believe it. He was also pretty sure he had lost it. But then again, maybe it wasn't too late. Maybe Dr. T could help him. Mott had to get to the clinic. Mott started running again, squinting to see through the rain and the trees. He wiped his eyes, but instead of clearing his vision, this just swiped away another glop of sea bonnies. He flicked it off his fingers, and in the glow for and in the glow from someone's pool lights, he could see it hit a tree branch. Immediately, the sea bonnie slithered down the trunk, found a narrow channel of water between two roots, and followed it back to Mott. He felt the sea bonnies slip up his shin as he kept running. Finally, Mott reached the end of the green belt. He careened off one last tree, and he stepped out onto the rain-pounded sidewalk that led to the back door of the clinic. No, that wasn't right. He didn't actually step out, he flopped out. He couldn't step up anymore because it was constantly coming apart. With every motion he made, pieces of flesh fell away and turned into a heaving swell of sea bonnies, which swam chaotically and then coalesced into a formation that once again sought their fellows, and they, of course, were in Mott. Not Mott. Oh my god. This is crazy. Mott wasn't Mott anymore and he knew it. He tried to dismantle himself. He pulled at his cheeks and his ears and his arms and his chest and his hips. He tore off handfuls of his flesh and tissue, throwing them aside. He realised some remote part of his brain, maybe a part not yet infested by sea bonnies, thought that if he could tear through in, tear enough of himself away, he might unearth the few cells of Mott that were still Mott. But each time Mott discarded parts of himself, the parts became determined masses of sea bonnies that doggedly uh, found a way back to him, reattaching and reassimilating faster each time he tried to toss them. They were now doing that so powerfully that Mott even heard a sound when they came rushing back to him. It was a slurp, kind of like sucking the last bit of a milkshake through a straw. But that description was too benign. The sea bonnies weren't benign. They were malevolent, through and through. All the sea bonnies wanted to do was vanquish every aspect of Mott. They wanted to vanquish him and conquer him. They wanted to be more than a colony. They wanted to be an empire. That's a line from before. And I'm pretty sure that the person who said that was his brother, Rory. I'm pretty sure. Uh, an empire formerly known as Mott. No matter what Mott did to resist them, the sea bonnies retaliated and resurged. They filled back in every hole created by his self-demolition efforts. When the chunks of flesh Mott lobbed away hit the ground, they immediately separated into swimming sea bonnies, which get, began returning to Mott. To get to him, they followed the standing water on the ground. They used the puddles. They even took advantage of falling raindrops. Any and all water became a conduit, leading the sea bonnies back to Mott. Once they reached him, the sea bonnies sought any ingress they could find. They swam up his pant legs, they slithered around his shirt, they wriggled over his shoes, they returned to themselves. They returned to him themselves, sorry, and their version of Mott every single time. As Mott fought this battle, he managed to get around the outside of the clinic. He was now close to the front door, collapsing every few seconds as he attempted to extract parts of himself, only to have them reform uh, immediately afterwards. Mott realised he had very little time left. He realised his thoughts were not really thoughts anymore. They were fragments. He was having trouble thinking of the people he cared about. His mum, Rory, friends, and Teresa. He, had, he tried to conjure images of them in his head, but he could only see pieces of them. Soon, he'd no longer be anything like what he used to be. How much time did he have? Maybe minutes, maybe seconds. Of the trillions of cells that had originally made up Mott, he figured only a few thousand were still as they'd been before the sea bonnie invasion. Mott managed to last few feet to the clinic door. Uh, sorry, Mott managed the last few feet to the clinic door. He reached for it, only to have his hand disintegrate in front of him and drop to the wet concrete. Claudia looked up from a computer screen, out through the darkened waiting room to the blackness beyond the clinic's windows. The clinic was hushed and still, and perhaps because it was so quiet, in spite of the storm, he could, she could hear something outside. It was kind of like a splashing sound, but not a normal rain spattering the ground sound. It was a bigger sound than that. It sounded like something large and squishy was falling into a body of water now and then. What Claudia heard between the splashes was odd too. She heard the, a sort of suctioning sound, almost a whistling. This was similar to the weird noise her vacuum made whenever she accidentally sucked up something wet. 
After the third time she heard that sound, Claudia decided to look outside the clinic to see what might be causing the peculiar noises. Making sure her computer was secure, Claudia stood and walked through the hushed waiting room. Hesitating for a couple seconds by the door, and not sure why, Claudia eventually pushed the heavy glass door open. She peered out into the deluge and saw Mott. Mott stood there as if standing in heavy rain was a perfectly normal thing to do. The rain sluiced through over his brown hair, which was matted to his head. It ran down his face and it pattered against his clothing. Claudia wasn't sure what to make of this. She decided to act the same way Mott was acting, as if everything was normal. Well, hello, Mott, Claudia said. She kept her expression neutral. Claudia had known Mott since he was a baby. He was a nice boy, never a problem at the clinic. He'd been in yesterday and this morning, she knew. She didn't know why Dr. T didn't discuss his patients with Claudia, even when the patient was almost part of the family. Mott didn't look particularly healthy though. He had an unnatural bluish tint and he was so pale that he was almost see-through. When Mott didn't respond to her, Claudia asked, are you okay? Suddenly, Mott smiled. Yes, it's a nice day. Everyone should be outside. Again, Claudia was a little nonplussed. She leaned forward to look in Mott's eyes. She was checking to see if his pupils were okay. They did. She smiled at him. He smiled back. Then he turned and walked away into the rain. Claudia tried to see where he was going. She thought maybe she could call him back, but it was too late. The rain was coming down so relentlessly that once Mott was a few feet away, he seemed to disappear. Oh. Okay. Okay, that's not the direction I thought that that story was going to go. <laughs> also, my throat's very dry. Let me just have a drink. Okay. That was pretty good. I like that. Uh, I think it could have been a lot better. Honestly, like, I think it had a lot of potential. I really enjoyed the beginning of the story. Uh, I feel like Rory just kind of left the story halfway through. I feel like he could have come back in some way. Um, also, I thought it was interesting with the, uh, the clinic and how they didn't say anything when he told them the full story. They were just like, go home go and tell somebody, we can't help you, we're not therapy, uh, go get therapy, you know? Um, I find that interesting, how they, how they don't even, like, try to help at all. Uh, I don't actually, I don't know, I don't know what happened here. This is very confusing. It sounds a little bit like Michael, I guess, and maybe Ennard, maybe an Ennard parallel? Huh, I, I don't know. But thank you so much for watching. Tell me what you think in the comments below and I will see you in my next audiobook, which is Together Forever. Yay. <laughs> see you later.